Welcome. This video is going to go over solutions to the Chapter 4 test on covalent bonding and molecular shapes. Question 1 wants to know the best description of the bonding present in the ammonium ion. So you should realize that ammonium um, bonds covalently, the nitrogen bonds covalently to all four hydrogen with an electron left to donate, making it a plus one polyatomic ion. So that means it shares electrons between the four hydrogen and the one nitrogen. So A is going to be my best choice. B is describing an ionic bond, which this is not. C is describing a metallic bond, which this is not. I think I got metallic spelt wrong there. And then D is, is describing both a covalent and an ionic bond, but it's just A, just a covalent bond, four single covalent bonds. Question number two, then, wants to know how the bond angles in these three molecules compare. And what you'll realize when you sketch them is that CH4 is tetrahedral with all bonding sites, so it's going to have a bond angle of 109.5. NH3 is also tetrahedral with its electron domains, but it does have a lone pair, so that means the three hydrogens actually have bond angles of 107. And then H2O is also tetrahedral with its electron domains, but it's got two bonding pair, so its bond angle has been squeezed even tighter to 105. So that makes D the correct choice. H2O has the smallest bonding angle, CH4 the largest. Question number three wants to know how many atoms is each carbon directly bonded to in its allotropes? And this is one you just have to memorize. Diamond being the hardest is able to bond to four. And then graphite and fullerene have um, some unique properties also, but they're not as hard as diamond is because they each only bond to three different carbon. So B would be my correct choice for number three. Number four asks, what type of solid materials are typically hard, have high melting points, and poor electrical conductivities? So this is going to be both ionic and covalent network. Metallic is typically hard with a high melting point, but they have good electrical conductivities. So just one in three have poor conductivities as solids, along with the high melting point and the rigidity. Number five wants to know which intermolecular forces exist between molecules of carbon monoxide. Well, carbon monoxide is triple bonded, and so this is a polar bond. That means it has dipole-dipole forces going on, but not hydrogen bonds. And then it also will have potential van der Waals or London forces. So B would be the correct choice on number five. Number six wants to know what is the correct order the compounds are arranged in order of increasing boiling point. So what you're supposed to realize is that you've got three carbon compounds, one with four hydrogens on it, so that's going to be all London dispersion forces around it. You've got one with the chlorine on it, so that's going to have some dipole-dipole forces around it. And then the CH3OH is going to have a hydrogen bond with it. So those three are going to boil in that order. CH4 will boil the easiest. CH3CL with its dipole-dipole forces will take a little more. And then CH3OH with that hydrogen bond will take a bit more. So then the question is, how does SiH4 fit in? Well, SiH4 also is going to have just London dispersion forces, but the Si is heavier than the carbon, so it's going to fit. My correct order is right here because I've got CH4 lighter with London dispersion forces. I've got SiH4, which is slightly heavier with just London dispersion forces, and then I have CH3Cl, that has dipole-dipole uh, forces, and finally then CH3OH, which has the hydrogen bond. So they're making you take into account both intermolecular forces and then also mass um, with the silicon tetrahydride with it. Number seven wants to know which substance is made up of a lattice of positive ions and free-moving electrons. This is describing a metallic bond. Graphite is carbon. Sodium chloride is a metal and a nonmetal. Sulfur is a nonmetal. Only D should have a metallic bond in it. Number eight says the Lewis structure of SO2 is given below. What is the shape? Well, they've drawn it linear, but what you have to realize is there's a lone pair here, which is going to bend this tighter than linear. So it's going to be bent with about a 117 degree bond angle. 
Question number nine says metal M has only one oxidation number, so it's not a transition metal. It forms a compound with the formula CO3. So since CO3 has a minus two charge, then we can assume that its one oxidation number is plus two. So which formula is correct? Well, with MnO3, O3 is a minus one, NH4 is a plus one, SO4 is a minus two, and PO4 is a minus three. So the only one of these that it would also have a one-to-one -one relationship it with is the one that also has the minus two charge. So MSO4 would be the correct choice. Number 10 says, which species have a dad of covalent bond? Remember, this is when one element donates both electrons. So the easy way for me to tell is when I draw them, like for example, when I draw CO, I see it has a triple bond and then they each have a lone pair. And what strikes me odd about this is carbon normally has four valence electrons. So if carbon is sharing three electrons and it has two left, this appears that carbon has five valence electrons, which it doesn't. So it seems to have an extra valence electron, the way this is drawn, whereas oxygen normally has six valence electrons. So if it's sharing three and has two left, it's missing a valence electron. So that's my clue that this is actually a dad of bond. The missing valence electron is actually being put into one of these bonds and it's a dad of or coordinate covalent bond. NH3 on the other hand, there's nothing unusual about that. Nitrogen has three unpaired electrons that it can share and then the one lone pair, so that seems pretty normal. H3O plus means that either oxygen is short an electron or one of the hydrogens is short an electron. Um, so if we take a look at that, I've got oxygen normally shares two, but it's actually going to share to all three, and it has a lone pair, so oxygen's not missing an electron by any means. Um, or it, if it is, then hydrogen would have to have two electrons to form the bond. So it has to be a hydrogen that's missing the electron. So one of these um, hydrogen atoms has no electron to donate, so oxygen donates both electrons, thus being able to form three bonds, one of them being a coordinate covalent bond. So one and three are both, both coordinate covalent bonds, and that would fit with letter B. Number 11 wants to know which substance can form intermolecular hydrogen bonds in the liquid state. So when you look at A, you should realize that the O is going to be sandwiched between the two CH3 or methyl groups. So that's not a hydrogen bond. CH3, CH2, HOH, that is a hydrogen bond, the CH3 and CH2. CH3, CHO, is letting you know that it's CH3, it's got the three hydrogen groups on, then a C, an H, and then a double bonded O, so that's not a hydrogen bond, and there's not even the possibility of a hydrogen bond in letter D. So B would be my correct choice. Question number 12 wants to know, which is the best description of ionic bonding? Well, ionic bonding is all about the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. So A, B, and C aren't quite phrased correctly. Electrostatic attraction between charged nuclei, no, it's a charged ion. And an electron pair, no, an electron pair is not an ion. Electrostatic attraction between positive ions, that's good, but no, they're not delocalized, they're just negative ions, but they're held rigidly. Positive ions and delocalized electrons, no, that's a metallic bond. So oppositely charged ions, that's the only one that fits in number 12. Number 13, when C2H2, C2H4, and C2H6 are arranged in order of increasing carbon-carbon bond strength with the weakest first, well, you have to realize that C2H2 has a triple bond, whereas C2H4 has a double bond, and C2H6 has all single bonds or is saturated. So that is the weakest one with the single bond, then the double, then the triple. So letter C fits for number 13. Number 14, predict and explain which of the following compounds consist of molecules. Well, molecules have to be covalently bonded. So that means they have to have an electronegativity difference greater than zero, well, zero or greater, and less than 1.8. So you could look up the electronegativities, or typically these are between nonmetals. So NaCl 
is going to be ionic. BF3 is going to be covalent. CaCl2 is ionic. N2O is covalent. P4O6 is covalent. Iron sul sulfide is ionic. And CBr4 is covalent. And again, the explanation is that it has to be between um, 0 to 1.8 difference in of electronegativity to be considered covalent. Number 15 wants to know why silicon dioxide is a solid. So silicon dioxide is going to have a structure looking like this. It's going to have two lone pair and the two oxygen um, bonded on. That's actually it. Like, uh, let's see if I can erase this. No. Nope. So actually this is incorrect. So it's going to be looking like CO2 since it's like carbon. So silicon dioxide is going to actually be able to form a giant covalent structure. And again, this is just one of those things that you have to be able to memorize. Whereas CO2 does not form that giant covalent structure. It just has uh, London dispersion forces between it. So that is going to be the difference is silicon dioxide's ability to form a giant covalent structure, whereas uh, CO2 does not form that giant covalent structure and just has the weak van der Waals forces between it. Number 16 wants to know the first ionization energy of an atom to find the term. And this was a little bit tricky because it just says of an atom. So you had to mention its energy and it's the energy to remove one electron from a gaseous atom. So you had to mention that it has to be a gas and it's just the one electron. Because we're not talking about a whole mole's worth here, we're just talking about an atom. Number two wants to know the general increasing trend in first ionization energy. So it's telling you that it's going to increase as you go from sodium to argon. So why is that? Well, there's two reasons, two things that affect it. The energy level and the effective nuclear charge. Energy level is staying the same. So it has no effect on this trend. But even though it has no effect, it's important to note it. Whereas Z, the effective nuclear charge, is increasing, so it pulls the electrons closer and holds them more tightly. And that's the explanation for the increasing trend. Number 13, why does sodium conduct electricity but phosphorus does not? Because sodium has a metallic bond with delocalized electrons that are able to carry a charge, whereas phosphorus has a covalent bond, so electrons cannot move or the bond is broken. Number 17 wants you to predict the shape and bond angles for the following species. So CO2, if you draw the Lewis structure, it's got two oxygen double bonded and no lone pairs. So this shape is just going to be linear and the bond angle is going to be 180 degrees. CO3 2 minus, this is going to have two oxygen double bonded and the third oxygen is going to be, or two oxygen are going to be single bonded, the third is going to be double bonded. Overall it has a minus two charge, but there's no lone pair. So this is going to be trigonal planar and you're going to have a 120 degree bond angle. BF4 minus is going to have the four fluorines attached, the minus one charge to it. So this is going to be tetrahedral and its bond angle is going to be 109.5 degrees. And the number 18, methoxymethane, CH3OCH3, and ethanol, CH2H5OH, have the same relative molecular mass, so they weigh about the same, and yet methoxymethane has a much lower boiling point than ethanol. So mass isn't a factor, so what is? Well, it's all about how this oxygen is bonded. In methoxymethane, you've got the three hydrogens attached to the carbon, you've got the oxygen in between, so this has got London dispersion forces, and it has a dipole-dipole force in it. Not a hugely polar, but some polarity to it, but not nearly the strength as we see in the uh, ethanol, because in the ethanol, 
I have one carbon with the three hydrogens, and I have my second carbon with two hydrogen, and then this OH or hydrogen bond group. So this has the hydrogen bond as well as the dipole-dipole forces, as well as the London dispersion forces going on. And anytime you have a hydrogen bond, it's going to drive the boiling point much higher. And number 19, explain the electroconductivity of molten sodium oxide and liquid sulfur trioxide. Well, sodium oxide, Na2O, is an ionic compound. And when ionic compounds are liquid, the ions are free to move, which makes it a good conductor. It doesn't have to be electrons moving. It has to be charge moving for electrical conductivity. Sulfur trioxide, on the other hand, is a covalently compounded. So as a solid, liquid, or gas, the electrons are not free to move. There are no ions, so there's not going to be good conductivity with a covalently compound, a covalently bonded compound.